Hey, well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to St. Mary's. If we haven't met before, my name is Matt, and I'm one of the uh, leaders at this church. And we're currently working our way uh, through a series on the character of David uh, from the Old Testament. And uh, John began just a couple of weeks ago looking at David's heart, his heart for God, his heart for worship as he danced naked before the Ark of the Lord, much to the dismay of his wife, uh, David's wife, not John's wife. Um, and then the week after that, Eileen looked at his courage as he faced the Goliath, uh, Goliath, the Philistine warrior. And today I'm going to be speaking about his friendship with a man called Jonathan. And while this is a series about David, this talk is really about Jonathan. Because he is the friend you want, and he's the type of friend that you want to be. But before we come to Jonathan, some of you uh, will be old enough to remember, trigger warning, the coronavirus pandemic, where for months on end, our ability to spend time with loved ones was restricted, where friendships and relationships were really sort of kept down apart from those who are in our immediate bubble unless they were reserved for being online. Now, much has been written about, much has been said about this, the impact that this had on older people, on children, those who lived alone during this time. However, in many ways, despite return to normality, we are still experiencing the hangover of this time. Many young adults who were at university during the pandemic have started describing themselves en masse as being socially stunted that having left their schools, sixth forms, and childhood friends have ended up at university, never meeting... Are you laughing because that's above my head? No. <laughs> my first draft, this just was massive words across the middle, and I thought somebody would take a photo of me with that above me, because it's what I would do to somebody else. Anyway, so having left their schools, sixth forms, and their childhood friends, they ended up at university. They never actually properly met their course mates except for being on Zoom. There was no freshness week, very few societies. And they left university having not uh, made the lifelong friends that so many people who go to university do make, but also more than this, not really knowing how to socialize and actually make friends properly. And they've left university their time, if they even went there um, physically, they've left coming out anxious and wondering perhaps if there's something even wrong with them. But it's not just Generation Z that has this issue. A recent YouGov survey, this is from last year, revealed that one in five Britons say they've become distanced from their close friends since the coronavirus pandemic. Half of Britons say they find it difficult to make new friends. A third of UK adults haven't had a meaningful conversation in the last week. In 2021, a report identified a male friendship recession with 15% of men saying they have no close friends, which has gone up from 3% in 1990. More than a quarter of UK adults agree that they worry something will happen to them and nobody would even notice. Professor Andrea Wigfield says chronic loneliness that is, the loneliness that impacts our mental and physical health, not just sort of feeling lonely from time to time. Chronic loneliness levels among all age groups rose during the pandemic, and they still haven't come back down. We need help. Increasing numbers of people feel unhappy, nervous, anxious in social settings, if they can even bring themselves to enter into those social settings, and some even feel like they are disappearing without anybody even noticing. Relationships, particularly friendships, are vital to our mental and spiritual and emotional health. We know this to be true. And this is something that we know to be true also from the scripture as well. The scripture would say that we are created for connection. We as humanity are made in the image of a God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Relationship from the very start to finish. And this is why we can theologically say that God is love. Because before the creation of the world, before there was any object of God's love, God loved within the person of the Godhead. Eternally loving, serving, and preferring one another. So in Genesis chapter 1, God creates the world. He says it's good. The pinnacle of his creation, he creates humanity. He looks at everything he's just made and said, this is very good. This is very good. Now the first thing that is not good when he looks at his creation comes in the next chapter, in Genesis chapter 2. And it's not sin entering in the world, though of course that's not good. It's not the serpent's deception that's not good. It's not the shame that the um, Adam and Eve experience from their nakedness before any of this brokenness enters the world. The, very, the one thing that is not good in this very good world is that man is alone. That humanity is alone. This is not how it is meant to be. 
And so you could say that loneliness is one of the deepest and oldest aches in the human condition. And perhaps you yourself have felt that ache during the pandemic, perhaps even now. Even being back at work, back able to see some friends, back in this very church, under the surface, a dull ache of loneliness may be ticking away. And of course, being lonely, as we know, doesn't really necessarily have anything to do with having people around us, does it? You can feel lonely in a crowd. You can feel lonely in your workplace, even if you're not working from home. You can feel lonely in the office. You can feel lonely at university, and perhaps most sadly, you can even feel lonely in your church. Because loneliness is a feeling that nobody knows me. Nobody knows me. Something has gone wrong with our friendships, and it is seriously detrimental to individuals in the society, our mental and our physical health, and is getting worse. And so, one of the greatest um, friendships that we read about in the Bible is between David and Jonathan. Um, David was the youngest son of a farmer called Jesse um, from Bethlehem, and from a very young age, um, David became a shepherd working in his father's fields, looking after his father's sheep. And despite his humble beginnings, we know that David is something of a rising star among his people. He's been anointed by the prophet Samuel uh, to become king. Um, He's just defeated Goliath, as we saw last week, and he's also becoming increasingly recognized as a man of military skill. Now, because David is such an important character in the biblical narrative, we expect to see him as like the lead actor, and any friends around him must surely just be in a supporting role. And so Jonathan is just sort of perceived as this sort of sidekick, Dr. Watson to David's Sherlock, Robin to Batman, Samwise to Frodo, Anna to Elsa. It's a Frozen reference. I've just watched Frozen with my children. David certainly is a rising star, but Jonathan, he's not just some weedy sidekick on the side. He is the firstborn son of King Saul. He was raised in a palace to become next in line to the throne. He may not have been anointed to be king, but he currently holds a lot of political power in the nation. He is, in his own right, a fantastic warrior and someone who follows closely with God. So their friendship, it's not one of sort of, here's the superhero and here's the sidekick, here's the lead and here's the second. This is two alpha males committed to one another, supporting one another and cheering one another on. So what principles can we take uh, from Jonathan and David's friendship that might help us with this issue that we face in our society and perhaps in our lives as well? Um, Let's begin by looking at our reading, which starts at the very beginning of 1 Samuel chapter 18. Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. And the ESV, another translation, says that Jonathan's soul was knit. The Hebrew word is kashar, to the soul of David. Kashar means to bind. It's like being woven together so much they can't really be pulled apart. Another translation might just say knotted together. They are knotted together. It's, there's no undoing this knot that has taken place. There is a steadfast connection that Jonathan makes um, with David. Jonathan loves David and he commits himself to him, not out of weakness, not out of insecurity, not motivated by power or ego, because of course he has plenty of that on his own, not out of opportunity, but because out of his strength, because he loves him as he loves himself. And so one of the essential ingredients that we need to find if we want to have amazing relationships and friendships is commitment. They have made a covenant between themselves. They've sworn friendship to one another. And we see later in the story that Jonathan Jonathan said to David, go in peace for we've sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord, saying the Lord is witness between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. Not only is there commitment between them, but God is at the very heart of their friendship. Now, you might be thinking straight away, I don't know what this actually looks like. And I think in reality, in practicality, we can't do this with everyone, but we can do it with a few. I think Jonathan could only do this with David. And the thing with making a commitment is making the commitments really the easy bit, isn't it? Anybody can make a commitment to another one. The hard bit is keeping the commitment. You know, in our sort of society where we have Facebook friends, what happens when you don't want a Facebook friend any longer? You don't have Facebook. You should have Facebook. The evening service don't have Facebook. You should have Facebook. You delete the friends you don't want. 
And really, if you can delete a friend, they probably weren't really a friend in the first place. But what God calls us to have in our relationships is more integrity than this. When things get tough, I will stay committed to you. It's the type of friendship that we are invited into. So Jonathan makes this commitment to David just after he kills Goliath. So it's kind of a high point in David's story. So perhaps if we were being really cynical about this, we'd say, oh yeah, he's just hitching his ride to the sort of the guy who's the rising star, the guy who's like this celebrity in Israel right now. Of course, that would be missing what's actually happening in the rest of the text. Because we see later that when David becomes a fugitive, when Jonathan's own father, King Saul, is running after him and David is on the run from him, Jonathan does not join his father. Instead, in that moment, he renews his covenant with David. He says, look, David, this situation, things look like it's changed for you. I want you to know I'm not going anywhere. I still have your back. We have sworn friendship to one another in the name of God. And God invites us to have relationships like this. Now, you don't need to have many of these, but I suppose my question this morning is, do you have any? Do you have any friendships like this? He invites us to have friendships where we walk with the other and we say, I will be by your side. I will have your back to the end. I'm here for the long haul, no matter how dark things get. I suppose one of the things about any commitment that we might make, whether it be a friendship or anything else, is that there's always a cost attached to making a commitment like this. It certainly did um, for Jonathan, because Saul, on hearing that Jonathan had gone with David as opposed to going with him, he was furious. His anger flared up, and he, um, you know, basically threw a spear at his own son in order to kill him. Commitment can be extremely costly. We can't commit to everyone, but to have meaningful friendships, we just want to commit to a couple of people and say, I will be with you through the good and the bad. So great friendships, they necessarily involve commitment, but they also great friendships also include encouragement. So this is 1 Samuel 23. Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at Horesh and strengthened his hand in God. Jonathan strengthened David in God. If there is a quality that we should be looking for in our friends, it's one that will choose to strengthen us in God. How does Jonathan do this? Next verse, Jonathan encourages David by reminding him of the Lord's promise. Do not be afraid. You will not be harmed. You will be king over Israel. Jonathan speaks God's promises over his friend in a time of peril. When you are in a difficult place and you have the voice in your head going over and over and over again, telling you how bad the situation is, how impossible this situation is, how there's no way you're getting out of this situation, the last thing that you need is a friend going, I agree, or echoing or feeding the anxiety or even just offering you comfort based on just trying to make you feel better. So much better is to hear the affirming voice of God. God's word gives strength and comfort and wisdom and guidance in times of need. It brings hope. And we need friends who can draw on these things and share them with us. And really, this relationship, this connection with God that Jonathan has is one that he shares um, with David. It's actually the foundation of their friendship we see earlier. They both put God at the very center. And this is, I think, what brought together a crown prince and a harp-playing shepherd boy together. They both trusted in God. So many friendships just lack depth. We may have lots of friends, but they lack depth. And I don't want to be overly simplistic about this, and I'm sure there are lots of different reasons why people struggle to have depth in their relationships. But I wonder if if the friendships that lack depth often have a basis on things that just pass away, tend to disappear. Is a shared interest in football or a hobby or just the fact that you grew up next door to one another enough to keep you together? And it's not that those things are bad. You have to start somewhere. They're great places to start a friendship, but it doesn't have to be the place where the relationship or the friendship stays. A friendship could be far more than just based on these commonalities that we share with one another. I think if you think about the best friendships that you have um, with other people, the strongest friendships, I suspect whatever their origins, you would say that this was really, really wrought in times of hardship. It was in the difficult times that this relationship changed. That this friend demonstrated the commitment that we've just spoken about at our lowest point, and from then on, the friendship was taken to a new place. And I would suggest that a relationship, a friendship rooted in God, will produce a lifetime of stories of God's faithfulness as we contend for one another in prayer, 
as we build one another up in what we know about the character of God. We are invited to go deep in our relationship with God and to bring that knowledge into our friendships and relationships. We are to speak encouragement over one another, to speak life to our friends and to expect that in return, whatever our circumstances. So great friendships involve a commitment, they involve encouragement, but they also involve vulnerability as well. 1 Samuel 18, Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and he gave it to David, along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow, his weapon, and his belt. These are two alpha males. Jonathan has committed himself to David and what he's doing now is he's being vulnerable with him. For there to be good friendship, there has to be a degree of vulnerability between one another. Now, understandably, we don't much like vulnerability at all, do we? We would much rather protect ourselves from anything uh, that may come upon us. So a few years ago, I was in the park um, with my um, goddaughter. She was running around. She was having an absolutely fantastic time. And then another slightly older child appeared. And they were playing. They were playing next to one another. They made eye contact with one another. And then my goddaughter, out of the blue, very loudly, very directly said, do you want to play with me? And the other girl stared at her and went, yes, I do. And my goddaughter went, let's go. And they ran off. They're playing hide and seek, chasing one another down the slides. Now, my goddaughter at this stage, she was three years old. There's no filter. There's no experience of shame or rejection from putting yourself out there. She has none of the walls that I have to protect myself from embarrassment or rejection. It was total freedom that she showed in that moment. And despite those things, I was challenged watching this interaction take place. Because I, on the other hand, find it very difficult to put myself out there, to approach other people, um, to spend time in this way. Um, my wife, Pip, who's far more extroverted um, than I am, is very good at filling her diary with dinners and coffees and dates and other things um, like that. And so unless we have plans together, there's a good chance during the week that I will have an evening um, to myself. And I felt myself when I had this, saw my goddaughter um, acting this way, I thought, I could definitely put myself out there more. I could approach more people um, to spend time with them, to build the friendships that I already have, to start new ones. And do you know what? As I did that, nobody died. Nobody died. None of us like vulnerability. Nobody likes putting themselves out there to forge new friendships. It can feel daunting. But I'm going to ask you, what's the worst that could happen? What's the worst that could happen? And what's the best that could come from doing that, from putting ourselves out there? In our relationships, there is a freedom that also comes from being vulnerable um, with one another as well. Um, I was reading um, an article by Brad, not by, about Brad Pitt the other day. It was talking about his divorce um, from Angelina Jolie and how he spent 18 months um, in Alcoholics Anonymous uh, because this is one of the reasons cited for their separation. And um, Brad Pitt ends up in AA for a long time and he's in this recovery group. It's composed entirely um, of other men. And what he said about this is that their vulnerability, their vulnerability moved him to his very core. So you had all of these men, and he said this, you had all these men sitting around being open and honest in a way that I had never heard. It was this safe space where there was little judgment and therefore little judgment of yourself. And so he himself shared in this group over time, and nobody in that group um, shared his stories to the tabloids. The men trusted one another, and in that trust, he found what he described as a catharsis. He said, it was actually really freeing just to expose the ugly sides of yourself. There's great value in that. Now, that's not a friendship context. I'm sharing that because I'm showing the value that um, vulnerability can have when we share it with one another. It's the freedom that comes from it. But if we think about our current cultural context, the things I started with, the friendship deficit that is being experienced, the friendship recession, and where we do have friendships, there's a lack of depth to them. There's only going at a surface level. What is actually the context for this vulnerability that we might experience? Where is this context for us to do this? It's probably easier to be vulnerable with strangers, but I believe that the experience of vulnerability in a grace-filled, non-judgment, sorry, a judgment-free friendship will be all the richer for it, for being known and loved by this person. And of course, this context, this friendship, this unrestricted, grace-filled, judgment-free friendship is rooted and modeled on our friendship with God. As we've just celebrated earlier in communion, there's no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ. We have been reconciled. We have become friends with God. We are loved. We are free. And we can approach him just as we are. 
knowing that we can come to him because he has already made the first move. He has pursued us first. And from this position, we can go and do the same in our friendships with one another. So, what's the next step? How do we have these kinds of friendships? Friendships that are committed, encouraging, and vulnerable. Well, I think that in the story of our lives, where we play the main character, ergo David, what we're looking for is we're looking for people like Jonathan to come up to us and to commit themselves to us so that we might have this friendship. But I'd like to suggest that the secret to great friendships is not to be a David, but in fact to be a Jonathan to someone else. That if you want a depth in your friendships, you've got to take the armor off. We need to make the decision to serve and to prefer and to love others first. It doesn't have to be everyone, but it could be just a couple of people. For the friendship to flourish, we need to commit to them in good times and in bad. And as costly as that can be, encourage them by reminding them of what God has done in the past and will do again. Of your shared experience of what God has done since you have been friends. And to vulnerably pursue them and to prove yourself trustworthy so they would have the courage to be vulnerable and to experience the freedom that they so need. Okay? Finally, I just have a few thoughts on how we might apply this um, to our community um, today. Those um, statistics and um, statements that I read out at the very start um, of this talk, they're recent. They're from last year, 2023. The earliest one was from 2021. These statistics almost certainly apply to people in this room. Even if you didn't necessarily resonate with them yourself, there will be people in this room that is exactly their lived reality in this moment. We can all experience loneliness in a crowd, even in a church, because loneliness is a feeling of that nobody knows me. And so together, I'd like to invite us all to change this, to ensure that this be a church where everybody is known, at least a bit. And there are natural places where this can take place. Straight after this service, just by happenstance, there is going to be a community lunch where we're going to have meals together. It is a great way to get to know your friends, the people who you like seeing every week when you come to church on Sunday. But you can queue up, grab your food, and find somebody who you don't know quite so well and just invite them to be with you. Meet your friends, share a little bit about yourself, ask a few questions about them. The same is true for the cafe before church, which, by the way, starts at 10.30 in the morning. Now, some Sundays, you have done very well to make it here for the start of worship. Not the kids' worship at 11. You've done really well to make it here for 25 past when the actual worship starts. But on other Sundays, other Sundays, could you commit? Or could you choose to be intentional about arriving early so that you can speak with people who have also arrived early? To commit yourself to be intentional about meeting other people and speaking to them. It can be really difficult to talk to people after the service unless we have a community lunch because people with young babies, they have to dash out. It's all a bit chaos as people are going across the school. So that before bit can be really important. And so you don't have to do it every week, but maybe you could go once a month, I'm going to make the effort to come in at 10.30 and I'm going to talk to whoever's going to be here. And I wonder whether just for the next couple of weeks and the lead up to Easter, could we just start inviting one another around for dinner? finding some people from this service go, I'm going to be intentional about inviting people um, into my space. Now, not everybody loves hosting or don't feel they have the space where they can host, but we can all go for a walk in the park. We can grab a coffee from Starbucks, go around Regent's Park or something like that. Can we just go crazy the next couple of weeks and just find people in this service who we want to get to know a little bit better? Invite some of your friends who you know well, invite somebody who you don't know quite so well, just so that everybody in this room is known a little bit by someone. And finally, and uh, Barn of the Band can go up. Um, I can't stress enough just how great it is to be part of a small group. Um, I've been part of a small group for a number of years. Alex and Hannah Rifka Perkin are my small group leaders. And it's a brilliant environment to put into practice all of the things that's been said in this talk. To commit to a group of people over a long period of time. To encourage one another with what you know about God and to contend for them in prayer. And to be vulnerable and to share what's going on in your life and to ask them to pray for you. Friendships do not happen overnight. They take time. It's the only way they can. And this is a great context to have a weekly or bi-weekly way of meeting a group of people. If you want to know more about that, you can speak to Andy Haith, who heads up our small groups, or you can go onto our website, stmaryslondon.com. We cannot do everything. We can't solve the broader problems in our society um, to do with loneliness. But whether we regularly feel lonely ourselves, or whether we don't, we can all do a little bit together to ensure that this church everybody feels known by someone.
And I invite you to join with me as we do this. Amen.